Stop anybody in the road and say, who are you? Nobody can say, I belong to this ancient civilization. This is my value system, this is who I am. You're ashamed to say that. So when Nehru said we made a twist with destiny, he did not mean we're connecting with the old civilization. He meant we're making a cut away, cut away from the old civilization. The identities of Aryans and Dravidians are spurious. At the genetic level, there is no such thing as race. Race is a social construct. It is not a scientific construct. Scientifically, if you can say these markers constitute a race, if you define it that way, I'm willing to listen. But then there's no such definition of race at all. There is no Aryans, no Dravidians. So the common sense is our own internal evidence that has got no memory whatsoever of an invasion, migration, or any such nonsense. Isn't it amazing that 200 years ago, the British missionaries came and said, you're Aryans, Dravidians, and tribals, and we wholeheartedly believe this nonsense. So uh, today we'll be talking on addressing problems in the narration of Indian prehistory. I don't like the word prehistory, by the way, because prehistory implies there is a history, there's a proto-history, and so on. And the way historians define this is when writing is there in a culture or civilization, then you have history. Prior to that, you have prehistory. Such an approach demerits our own civilization, because for the longest time, we've had an oral tradition. The Shruti, Shruti literature is an oral tradition where we have got error correction mechanisms in our oral transmission, like the Kramapatha and others. There are formulas the way you remember the, the literature. For example, you might take a Sanskrit verse and say first syllable, second syllable, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, and so on. Or you may have an even more complex formula like one, two, three, two, three, four, or one, two, two, four, one, two, two, three, and so on and so forth. So the point is that we have got such complex ways of remembering our oral literature that there is error correction mechanisms built into it. So we have got high fidelity oral transmission from the earliest times to the present times. There is no reason why we should discredit our own uh, deep oral traditions. So the word I'd like to use is deep history. Deep history combines oral traditions, it combines all the other things I'm going to talk to you about. Those are a part of deep history. So. Uh, before I start, Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. I pay respects how citation trial goes to our gurus and the uh, teachers who lived in the past era and teachers who live today. So I'd like to start always by setting the context. And the context I want to talk to you about, an unsatisfactory historiography of India exists. Historiography is the process of writing history. You might wonder, who wrote the history of India the way we uh, see it today, right? So uh, the way I look at it is, we have several issues in the narrative of Indian history. We have something that I call an evidence-based history that any common person who's scientifically uh, inclined can investigate. And there is a questionable narrative of Indian history that has been enforced, enforced in NCRT, enforced in our textbooks, enforced in our constitution, in our laws, in our popular media, everywhere enforces this. So our evidence shows we are an ancient civilization. This one claims that we are a recent civilization. We can show that we are indigenous, similar people. However, they tell us that we are Aryans, Dravidians, and tribal people. I'd like to point out to you that in India, the word Arya has always meant a noble person. It's an honorific. As an example, Dushasana is an Anarya for his role in disrobing Draupadi. So we always refer to Arya as a noble person, honorific. However, the colonial people made this into a racial category, the English word Aryan became a racial category, people from Central Asia, completely against everything this civilization has known. Similarly, Dravida is a Sanskrit word that refers to the southern part of India. So you find the word uh, used several times in our history. For example, Varahamira, he refers to Dravida. Kumarila Bhatta in Tantravartika, he refers to Dravida. Adi Shankara, he says, I'm a Dravida Sishu. So we got several usages of the word Dravida in a geographical sense. However, the missionary, Robert Caldwell, he made this into a racial category, inventing the word Dravidian. So you say Dravidian is a racial category. So you see, the fraud has been played on you for a very, very long time. And today we unquestioningly take this, uh, whatever has been indoctrinated in our minds, and we continue with that. But this is the evidence that shows that. They say that we got our knowledge with input from Babylon and Greece, but we can show that India is an ancient civilization in line with that, we have got huge developments of knowledge systems. 
we have humane, enlightened philosophies in Vedanta and other such things with Mahavakyas like Aham Brahmasmi, Tattvamasi, and these kind of words that show the philosophical aspiration of the people. Even if we did not achieve, achieve that, those are the aspirations of the civilization. But they tell us that we are aggressive, uncivilized, inhumane philosophies. This is the kind of narratives put on us, and so on. A whole lot of problems are there. So I question how did these things come about? And I have identified five frameworks who control the historiography of India. And I call attention to the missing framework. The colonial people, when they came to India, they wanted to write the history of India for their civil servants. They presented India as a backward, primitive, superstitious society, and Europe as a forward, progressive, technologically advanced society. That's how they presented it. So a whole lot of problems came there. Eurocentric people wanted to ask, why are Sanskrit, Latin, and Greek related? And so to address that question, they, the field of linguistics was born, and they had several Eurocentric ideas to show that it is from European lands and so on. Wherever colonial people were there, missionaries were not far behind, so they wanted to convert the southern Indian to uh, uh, Christianity. They first landed up in the south, and so a lot of their translations of Indian works, things like the Puranas, H.H. H. Wilson, things like the Vedas, Griffith, and others, their translations are motivated by a certain way of presenting Indian works as backward, superstitious, primitive. They ignored the metaphoric content. They ignored the, uh, the, the various ways of uh, addressing prose in Sanskrit literature. Everything was ignored to make translations appear as if they were done by drunken rishis, right? High on Soma or some such thing. Then since 1947, we have inherited Nehruvian socialism in the country and uh, that too has come with a set of biases. Socialism believes that the old order must be thrown out for progress. And if you want progress in a classless, utopian future society, then we have to destroy the old order. It believes that it can do this through the constitution. You don't need a bloody revolution like the Marxists require, but you can have through constitution means, bring in laws and things like that, and you can try to get rid of the old order. So all the laws, constitution, and the ways the government looks at us is based upon a socialist way of looking at us. Since 1972, we've got the Marxist uh, ideology also in India. And uh, this is the unfortunate consequence of where we are. So I say, history has been hijacked by the ideologies of these people, excluding the emic scholar, and led to a subversion of identity. Among these frameworks, do you see who's missing? The person of this civilization, who's knowledgeable about this civilization, the Sanskrit scholar, who lives this life, He's not allowed to say anything about the civilization. He's excluded. So we don't have agency. Agency has been taken away from us, and they control who we are. So that's what I say, excluding the Amic scholars, led to a subversion of identity. Today, nobody can say who they are as an Indian. If I stop anybody in the road and say, who are you? Nobody can say, I belong to this ancient civilization. This is my value system. This is who I am. You're ashamed to say that. So when Nehru said we made a tryst with destiny, he did not mean we're connecting with the old civilization. He meant we're making a cut away, cut away from the old civilization. This is a new India from here on. That's what he meant. So that is why we see a whole lot of problems in India with the subversion of our identity. This has happened over 300 years. We have got colonial hegemony, Portuguese, Dutch, French, British, hand in hand with Christian imperialism, people like Calvin, Gio, Pope, along with Eurocentrism, scholars like Max Miller, Herbert Risley, using linguistics, anthropology, the so-called notion of caste. In India, we only have something called Jati, Varna, Kulam, Gotra. Jati, Varna, Kulam, Gotra. Anywhere you go in India, this is what we have. We can talk for hours together about this. But they imposed something called caste on us. And worse, they said we are a caste-ridden society, whatever that means. So they brought in a certain lens to look at us. And they have convergent ideologies. Each of these forces have a convergent ideology. And it led to the so-called Aryan invasion migration theory into India. And since 1947 or even later, you might think in present day, these are all old ways of looking at India. So why not look at the new ways? Well, our academia uses the received wisdom of colonialists. They do not question it. Whatever has got for colonialists is received wisdom. And they continue with all of this nonsense. And we also have outsider sociology applied on us. Sociology that's appropriate for the Western experience. The Western people had 1,700 years of slavery. Ever since the Roman Empire adopted Christianity, 330 current era, they have practiced slavery. They have oppression of women. They've got world wars. They've got all kinds of problems. So there are social movements like, you know, looking at theocracy, looking at modernism, postmodernism, reformation, 
all those are appropriate for their civilization. But our sociologists have imported these models and force fed it on the Indian diaspora and the Indian people rather. So we have the situation where the angry white male of Europe became the angry Brahmin male in India, however ill-fitting that is, but this is the way our academia works. So it works hand in hand with archaeology and today with genetics. Once again, there are circular dependencies. These are not independent fields of study. Each field uses constraints from the other field in order to get its results. That's what I've shown in my research over here. And so we have questionable assumptions, circular dependencies. It directly impacts a Bharatiya identity, who we are as a people. Are we who they say we are, or does science say something else? So today I'm here to talk to you about some of these things over here. So in a cartoonish image, this is the outsider frameworks imposed, colonial, Eurocentric, missionary. They work with the presumption that Christianity is the only true religion and superiority of the white Europeans. Their goal was to uphold Bible's chronology, show Hindus as primitive, superiority of white Europeans, and to promote Christianity. And socialist academia and Marxists, by destroying Hinduism, can get a classless utopia. And they have the subaltern studies, the oppressor-oppressed lens. All of Indian social dynamics has been reduced to oppressor-oppressed. Who oppressed whom? Somebody over here, his ancestors oppressed this person, that person oppressed this person. That is the only lens that has been imposed on India. Gone is your Vedanta. Gone is your philosophy. Gone is all your Mahavakyas. None of that matters in the socialist Marxist framework. What matters is some oppression has been there. And they want to show class conflicts. And today, everybody wants to be a victim, right? Wokism, everybody wants to be a victim. So we are saying, in addition to these things, southern India, rather only Tamil Nadu, you got Dravidianism, a uh, deracinated framework that finds common ground over here. And in the West, you got leftist Islamism also starting, which is morphed into wokeism, and you see certain things happening over here. Why does any of this thing matter? Why do these things matter for what you're saying over here? Well, this notion that there was an Aryan invasion in 1500 BCE, nomads of Central Asia destroyed superior civilization. India had to wait for 1,000 years of civilization to return to Magadha. These are not my words. These are from NCRT. From NCRT textbook, I straight away copied these things, where they say when the Greeks made contact with Magadha in 300 BCE, suddenly we got the Brahmi script, suddenly we have Ashokan needed, and we became civilized. Civilization to them means you have a script. We became civilized overnight, and then they say you have not had enough time for knowledge generation, whether it is in mathematics, astronomy, medicine, you have not had enough time. Therefore, if there is evidence that you got Suri Siddhanta, Charaka Samhita, Aryabhatiya, you probably copied these from earlier civilizations like the Babylonians, Greeks, that is the way they present it. So every aspect of our knowledge systems is impacted by this fake narrative over here. And they say things like this, Aryans brought Sanskrit from Central Asia into India. Brahmi came from Arameyaks, a Semitic script into India. Astronomy came from Babylonians, math sciences from Greece. Turkic Muslims got us culture, cuisine, architecture, music, civilization. The British got us science, technology, and rational thought. And bhakti was even thought to us by St. Thomas, who came to Muziris and taught us how to have bhakti. So these are the kind of statements that are there, present out there, imposing on us. And there's a denial of agency. This led to a gross distortion of our identity. I call it a criminal distortion of Indian civilization. Whoever is responsible for this belongs behind bars. I hope the day will come when we can take the entire set of people controlling this and put them behind bars because they've subverted your identity. Generations and generations are growing up deracinated because of these kind of ideas. I, as a scientist, want to look at an evidence-based narrator to see where does the evidence say what we are. And when I say that, I mean I want a rational, logical analysis of the data, models, methods, frameworks, and claims. That's what I'm going to take, even if I'm not a historian. This is my methodology as a scientist whenever I approach a new field. So I say there's a lot of data for uh, his history, archaeology, climate records, genetics, religion, sciences, a whole lot of them. These can be used with models like linguistics, archaeology, genetics, astronomy. So many models are there to talk about uh, this one. So we can take the data that we have, look at the provenance of the data, the data good enough, apply it over here and see what it, uh, uh, it says, whether the claims can follow. That's what I do. And in the process, if this will work, I've got all of these models. I'm pioneering a model-based evaluation of the Indian civilization, in which I'm looking at linguistics model, textual model, 
archaeological model, genetics model, astronomy model, southern Indian model, and many others, and trying to examine assumptions, constraints, methodology, data, results, claims, and I'm trying to come with what does the narrative say about who we are as an Indian civilization. That's my methodology over here. And I'd like to start with linguistics, archaeology, and Aryans, inverted quotes, to see, show you how a theory took look, root. So William Jones, when he came to India, Calcutta, he saw that Latin, Sanskrit, and Greek are related, and he wanted to address that question. To address that question, they proposed that there must have been an ancestral language called Proto-Indo-European, and this language had a homeland. They had a lot of debate where that homeland is. Finally, they said Central Asia, between Caspian Sea and Black Sea, that is where this ancestral language was. And migrations from there took language to Europe as well as India. That's why we got commonality, because these are all daughter languages of Proto-Indo-European. So the homeland shifted from several places. I'm not going to bother about this. But I'd like to give you some idea of the linguistics itself, the frameworks. Today, there are several things like comparative linguistics, a methodology that was born from things, things like this. If I say, what is the word for milk? Let us say in uh, Tamil. In Tamil, I say pal. Pal is a word for milk. In Kannada, that becomes halu. In Telugu, it becomes palu. So the ha became pa. And from the strong pal, it became palu. So you see, syllables are added, syllables change, and so on. So linguistics was concerned with the morphology of the sound. Where is the sound formed? Is it formed the front of the mouth, the middle, behind? Do I have to roll my tongue and hit it against the teeth? If I say ta, I have to roll my tongue and hit it to the top. If I say ta, I have to hit the back of my teeth with that. If I say pa, I must join the lips together and say that. So this is called morphology of the sound. So they were concerned with, if I take 100 languages, 100 words in each language, the cognates meaning the same meaning, like palu, halu, and others are cognates, right? So they tried to see how did it change from one to the other, and they tried to propose a relationship. This is an older form of sound. This is a later form of sound. Based on subjective ideas like that, they came about with this notion. Then we got things like lexical statistics and others, but bottom line, laws like Grimm's law came about. So Grimm's law comes with things like this. Ba is an older form of sound, became ba, became pa, became fa. How did these things come about? So uh, things like these things came about, and how did these laws come about? It's pulled out of a hat. It's pulled out of a hat to support their theories, Eurocentric theories, that language went from Central Asia and became Balto-Slavic in the earliest route in 3000 BCE. And this side, 1500 BC, came towards Iran, from Iran into India, Sanskrit. To support these ideas, they had to see what is an earlier form of sound, what is a later form of sound. To service that ideology, they brought about these kind of laws conveniently, circular arguments, you see what I'm saying? That is how this thing came about. And to give an idea, this is the kind of thing they reconstructed, Proto-Indo-European. This is an ancestral language. No evidence that anybody spoke it. It's a reconstructed language academically. And from this, you have Balto-Slavic, Germanic, Celtic, Italic, Iranian, Indic, Sanskrit, and other such things. This is an idealization, obviously, but this is what people use to the present day. To give you an idea how this works, this is the famous bullock cart, right? Every Indian village, you'll see this bullock cart. This is there even in Harappa, as you can see. So typically, if a culture has got a bullock cart, you must have words that language for the terminology, for the technology, right? So these are the words. For wheel, in Sanskrit, chakra, Latin, rotem, Greek is kuklos, yoke is yoga, lugam, zigdo, uh, name is nabya, umbilicus, axa, axis. And the pro proposed reconstruction from PIE, they say there's a word called kweklo. Anything with a star means not a real word. It's a reconstructed word. From this reconstructed word, we get the proto-Indo-Iranian word called kekro. Again, no evidence for this word. It is reconstructed. From that, they say, we get the Sanskrit word called chakra. The punchline is not there. The punchline is, to develop this theory, the data was from Sanskrit. Sanskrit provided the data for them to reconstruct this. Then they turned it around, and they made PIE into a fact and Sanskrit is a derived aspect of that. So this is an example of circular reasoning. You start with some assumptions, you come to some conclusion, then you pretend that the assumptions are facts because you turn things around. That is exactly what they've done over here. Around the same time, Germany came with ideas of Aryanism. The Germans were left out of the colonial action that the British, French, Dutch, and other seafaring powers are doing. 
they were left out of the action. So they came about this notion of Aryanism. And uh, Gija, he suggested that Indo-Europeans are blonde, blue-eyed people, and these triads have become darkened and mixed with foreign admixture of genes. For example, he said originally they were blonde, white people. By the time he came to India, they mixed with the darker people here, and they became that. How did he get that? Is there anything in linguistics that say that? Nothing. He just pulled it out of a hat, and this became received wisdom. And they made dubious readings of the Vedic text to show that Aryans, fair invading Aryans, clashing with snub-nosed indigenous dasas. Things like the strained translations were done to do these kinds of things. And around that time itself, Datta, who's a nationalist, he said Germanism arose among the peculiar political, political conditions of 19th century Germany. We cannot see any reason why in India we should pin our faith in it. He criticized the slave psychology of the Indian mind way back then itself. He was seeing that everybody was sold on this idea. Anyway, a whole lot of dialogues went on where is the homeland for these people. Eventually, Caspian Sea, Black Sea, that is where they said that. And there are some people who said that changes in the ceramic record, meaning that in the pottery record, you see in archaeology, if you see a new kind of pottery in the archaeological record, it is indicative of a foreign culture coming in. So they proposed that by looking at changes in the Aryan record, we can figure out uh, these linguistic migrations. It worked somewhat for Europe, but it failed spectacularly for India because there's no change in the pottery record for the so-called Aryan invasion. The OCP or ochre colored pottery, they said started from 1500 BC and all onwards, but there are papers that show it is there in fourth millennium, 3000 BC onwards that pottery has been in India. So there are uh, several issues with this. Today there are two modern nar narratives, Maria Gimbutas, Colin Renfro, she came with the Kurgan or steppe hypothesis and he came with the Anatolian hypothesis. She said, in Central Asia, people domesticated the wild horse, then they got the iron sword. Once they got these two things, they were able to conquer the world. And she said it happened in three waves, between 4000 BC to 1500 BC to India. Colin Renfro said that invention of agriculture in Anatolia, which is Turkey, this modern Turkey, that led to spread of agriculture along with that languages too. But here today, many people say Kurgan is, uh, seems to be what they want to favor. And this is the Kurgan or steppe hypothesis that between Caspian Sea, Black Sea, Yamnaya people, 3500 BC, by 2500, they spread out to the west and to the east, the beaker ware, corded ware people. 1500 BC, they've been specialized as Hittites, Babylonians, Mycenaeans, and others. And here you see Bactria, Margiana, archaeological complex, and they've entered into Sindh, the beginning of so our Aryan invasion. And by 500 BC, the spread over the Ganga plain, you find the appearance of the people called Dravidian over here. So this is the dominant theory that has been pushed on us to the present day. So my rebuttal to this has, like I said, based on a lot of research which I've done, I've looked at textual evidence, archaeology, genetics, climatology, geology, astronomy, and so on. I'd like to start with a common sense question. The common sense question is, I've taken a set of names from here, from different geographies of India, different chronologies of India, starting with people like Abhinava Gupta, Adi Shankara, Agathya, Andalt, Yajnavalkya, Vyasa, Vishnu Sharma, and others, I asked the question, who over here is saying we used to live in Central Asia, we crossed the mountains and came to India and settled here? Is there a cultural memory anywhere of this great migration? Nowhere. Who over here is saying we invaded Northern India and we pushed the people living there to the South? Nobody. Who in the South is saying we used to live in the North, we were pushed to the south and now we live here. Not a single person, whether it's Sangamira works or any works, nobody is saying any of these things. So the common sense is our own internal evidence that has got no memory whatsoever of an invasion, migration, or any such nonsense. Isn't it amazing that 200 years ago, the British missionaries came and said, you're Aryans, Dravidians, and tribals, and we wholeheartedly believe this nonsense to the present day. This is a sad aspect of, uh, of what is going on over here. Parjita was a judge in British India in 1920s, and he was one of the first persons who noticed these things. As a judge, he can't make a blind statement, right? He's got to evaluate the facts. So he said, the current theory that Aryans invaded India through the Northwest must account for these facts. He says, Indian tradition knows nothing whatsoever of that, whatever I told you in the previous slide. Northwest Punjab is not an ancient home or with veneration of special esteem. The holy lands of India have always been Banaras, Kashi, Banaras, eastern part of India. If Aryans came from Northwest India, 
we must have some memories of some ancient sacred spots there. We don't have that. It's always been Kashi. That's how it is. So like this, he asked many questions and he asked, all this copious tradition in India, was it falsely fabricated? Has the truth been lost if the current RN theory is right? Is it probable? He's challenging the people who say Aryan invasion and saying there's such a strong tradition in India of an indigenous people. Is that false? Is that's a question he's asking. If this tradition is false, why, how, whose interest was it fabricated? He's asking that strong question. So he's saying Indian tradition suggests a reverse origin for the Iranians. According to linguistic theory, from Central Asia to Iranians to Indians, Aryans, right? That, but he's saying Indian tradition is showing a reverse origin for that. Very interesting. So he was one of the first persons to challenge this Aryan invasion theory. And the people like Srikant Telegiri today who have analyzed the Rig Veda, the language in Rig Veda, and they've called out a number of uh, paradoxes. If you situate the homeland of Proto-Indo-European in Central Asia, his contention is there are a number of paradoxes which cannot be resolved. But he says, if you locate the homeland in Northwest India, all these paradoxes disappear. He said, I can accept the PIE if you locate the homeland in Northwest India. That was his position. And Nicholas Kazadas is one more such Greek scholar. He made a study of the Indo, so-called Indo-European divinities the commonality and so on. And he said, all the mainstream academic publications on reconstructing PIE are utterly worthless. Very, very strong statement. He said, if there was an ancestral language like PIE, it is so far back in time that there is no data available to reconstruct that. Not even Sanskrit is enough to reconstruct that. That is his position. And he holds that to the present day. So this whole business of uh, invasion came about when after linguistic theory said Aryans had come to India, then they discovered Mohenjo-daro, Harappa, ruins over the late 1800s, and then they saw the ruins and said, must be an invasion. But the reality is, the person who excavated there, the archaeologist Marshall, he did not see any contact with Harappan and Aryans. He proposed Mohenjo-daro thrived from 3250 to 2750 BCE, ending 1,000 years before the so-called Aryans arrived. In his publication in 1931, this is what he says. This mischief was done by Vila, who is one more archaeologist who followed him. He brought that chronology forward in time from 2500 to 1500 BCE, making it possible for the Aryan invasion to have happened. So that is where we see this thing happening, including trying to translate the Rig Veda, things like the pores in Rig Veda. He said, uh, Indra, who is Purandara, Purandara means destroyer of forts. He's saying that he stands indicted because Rig Veda is like a war manual. Indra has come on chariots and destroyed the Harappan cities. So they started making readings of that nature and uh, trying to say these things. And it was further embellished people like Kosambi. Kosambi is the father of Marxist historiography in India. So he embellished this whole uh, thing even more. He said Indus end came after 1750. Abrupt termination, city set on fire, inhabitants slaughtered, violent end, and cities burned down, treasures looted, victory of barbarism over a far older superior urban culture. That was his presentation of what happened. How did he get these facts? Nobody should question that. It is his opinion. He, opinion, he made an opinion and our people blindly received this opinion. So, <coughs> excuse me, this whole invasion was challenged. P.V. Kane, in 1953, he said, you cannot extrapolate a destruction just by looking at a few skeletons. You cannot extrapolate it into an uh, uh, invasion kind of thing. At that time, George Dales, an American scholar, he said, even these skeletons don't belong to a single epoch in the, in the archaeological record. They belong to different epochs in the record. And then uh, George Dales also said, there is no destruction level covering the latest period of city, no extensive burning, no bodies of warriors clad in armor, weapons of uh, war. There is not a single bit of evidence that can be brought forth as unconditional proof of armed conquest on the destruction of the supposed scale of Aryan invasion. Very, very strong statements. He said, where is the evidence? Nothing is there. That's what he said. Kenneth Kennedy was one more American specialist, bone specialist. He said the bones of the skeletons show injuries that have healed before death. Supposing I go and chop somebody's arm and it dies in battle, that skeleton will forever, after a thousand years also, show the sharp edges. But supposing you survive, 
then the bone will heal, right? It'll have rounded edges. So he's saying that the injuries in the bones had healed well before death. In other words, there is no large scale destruction, there is no burning, there is no looting, nothing is there. But our people made this big theory about RN invasion. After these things, they changed the goalpost. From invasion it became migration. No longer anybody says invasion because they were challenged by several Western scholars themselves. So now it has become Aryan migration theory. So you can read this paper by Darino, Fabricating Evidence in Support of Aryan Invasion, where he makes strong statements, invention of non-existent texts, the people who try to make Aryan invasion migration, they have invented texts that don't even exist, <laughs> Sanskrit texts. They deliberately mistranslate text, invent non-existent archaeological evidence, distort the archaeological evidence, flaws like circular reasoning, racial theories that are utterly wrong, and demonizing scholars who don't like the uh, Aryan paradigm. This is the methodology that they use to try to hold on to this Aryan invasion. Utterly criminal distortion. No academic should be associated with these things, but this unfortunately continues. And there's a lot of evidence. I don't have the time to show you all the evidences, but I've collected, uh, curated a few of them over here that shows you things that don't support this. The Saraswati River. The saying is that the Aryans came to India in 1500 BCE and composed the Rig Veda in India. But unfortunately for them, Rig Veda says there's a flowing Saraswati river from the mountains to the ocean. The climatology tells us that this river dried up by 1900 BCE, 400 years before the supposed Aryans came, this river dried. There were tectonic plate movements in northern India because of Himalayan activity over there. And the Satlej river that today is feeding into Indus, those days it used to feed into Saraswati. This dotted line that you see here, this is the paleo channels of the Saraswati river. And that used to be fed by Satlej and at that time it was a flowing river. 1900 BC because of tectonic movements, we know from geology that it changed the river, changed course and joined the Indus and this one went dry. If it went dry, then how on earth did the Aryans talk about this? Well, the leftists said that it is because it, Saraswati is a mythical river. On the other hand, they also said it is some river in Afghanistan which they encountered on the way to India. So many scientists today have to prove, yes, there was a river. And there's one such paper that came out in 2019, where they say that by analyzing the mica and others, they found a, a stretch of this modern Gaga, 300 kilometers up to Pakistan border, that shows a powerful river in the past. That is their conclusion. They say it flowed in two phases, one 80,000 to 20,000 years ago, the second phase 9,000 to 4,500 years ago. Today we find many, many settlements along this ancient river course. Okay, so this is now a paper from Deccan College that is trying to show you all the settlements. You see this dotted line is the ancient Saraswati and these are all the archaeological sites, settlements. In ancient India, you could only situate next to a river. If there's no river, how do you get your water, right? But today there's no river anywhere nearby, clearly showing the presence of these things. And these people also did a lot of radiometric studies, radiocarbon dating of all these settlements. And I've just highlighted the oldest dates. Magar, the oldest date is 9,385 years before present. That is the oldest layers they're found in Magar. In Kalibangan, some of the oldest layers are 6,500 years, 700 years before present. If you go to Rakigadi, some of the oldest dates are 5,000, sorry, 6,180 years before present. If you go to uh, Birana, some of the oldest dates are uh, in BCE, 7,570, which is 9,500 years before present. So this is the data from radiocarbon studies by Deccan College that is showing you the antiquity of some of these settlements. Some of you may be wondering, what on earth is this? But guess what? I can show you the same antiquity in astronomy as well as in genetics. It is not so fantastic. It is fantastic if you believe Aryan invasion happened in 1500 BCE, that will put a constraint on our thinking. If you remove that constraint, consistently we can see all this evidence over here. B.B. Lal, who was one of India's famous archaeologists, he at the end of his career said that there is no periodization. If you think there's a Harappa period followed by a Vedic period, he said there is a cultural continuity in the material record. For example, the famous Pashupati seal Mohenjadaro or the swastika or terracotta figurines of women showing the Sindur symbol. Even today, some married women wear the Sindur. It's a cultural continuity from Harappa. Or a terracotta figurine showing Namaste. Namaste is a deeply Vedantic thing that says the Narayana in me is bowing to the Narayana in you. 
that is the idea. What is that doing in Harappa, right? So we are seeing that. We are seeing in Kalibangan, Shivalinga, yoga asana positions found by S.R. Rao and B.B. La, deeply Vedantic concept, the roots of Hinduism are in yoga, and we are seeing these things over here. That's why he said there is no periodization, but a continuity of civilization from the oldest times. This is a paper that came out in Journal of Archaeological Science in 2021. And I was very interested because they talked at some archaeological site in Rajasthan. They found some footballs. And those uh, uh, seven footballs are made of moong. They also found in the same area several bull figurines, like some part of ritual was conducted over there. I said this is exactly what Pindadana is. Even today, when we do ancestral offerings, we make rice balls and things like that and we leave it over there. So there's a cultural continuity from this Indus times on to the present times, that's what we have. So we are finding, uncovering newer and newer evidences that is tying in our modern practices going to an ancient period of time. It doesn't say it started with these invading Aryans. Rather, it goes back to very ancient times. Then if you believe people like Tiwari and Banerjee, they said that the Aryans brought iron into India, right? Indians only had bronze swords. That was no match for the iron swords of the Aryans. Therefore, they were defeated. But then we have found, for example, in Gachibauli in the University of Hyderabad campus, Professor K. P. Rao has found things like iron blades and implements and so on, which they have tested with optical simulated luminescence and dated at 1800 to 2400 BCE. Some of the oldest iron found in India is over here. <coughs> This is a work by this Japanese professor in 2018. He wanted to show where are all the archaeological sites where iron has been uncovered in India. The oldest iron is in Gachibauli, 2200 BC. Karnataka, Kudre, Badravati, you find a lot of iron. Even today, that's India's iron ore capital, literally. You find it over there. And southern in Tamil Nadu, you find these things. Kandra, you find it. But the amazing thing is, this technology is moving northwards. You find this is 2200 BC, is the oldest iron. If you go north, it's 1100 BC, 1500, 1800, 1200, and so on. If you come here, it is 1200 BCE. So this one is telling us, if Aryans came to India from the northwest side, the oldest iron must be here, and later on we must see the later ones. But we are showing a reverse movement. This reverse movement is in a strange way collaborated by textual evidence. If you look at Matsya Purana, if you look at other Bhagavata Purana, do you know what it says how Indians populated India? It says there was a Dravida Desha king, Matsya Purana, Dravida Desha king, he was Vaivasvata Manu. From south he went to Prayaga and through his children, Ishvaku and uh, Ila, they populated the entire India. It talks about the geography of India and so on and so forth. So it's a south to north that is mentioned peopling of India in our Puranas. This at least, I'm not claiming they are the same. The time periods may not be the same. But then this also shows a south to north transmission of technology. Then the chariots, right? They said that the Aryans brought horse and chariot to India. Don't ask how they crossed the Khyber Pass. You should not ask those inconvenient questions. But some of those chariots came over the mountains into India. But then today in Sanawli, just the north of Delhi, 20 miles north of Delhi, you find not one, not two, but many, many burials of chariots, right? And the archaeologist on duty is saying these are not bullock cart chariots. These are not donkey chariots. Clearly he's saying these are horse-driven chariots and he's found evidence of war also. He's found shields, helmets, swords and things like that. And so clearly we have evidence that chariots are there in India, tentatively dated to 2200 BC, before the so-called Aryans came. Then we have evidence that India suffered a 200-year monsoon around 4200 years ago. Today, if monsoons fail in India for one year, our GDP will go down because we are an agrarian society, right? If the monsoons fail for two or three years, farmers can't afford to pay back their loans. There'll be suicide, massive unrest will be there in the country, right? So imagine 200 years, just imagine for a minute, 200 years monsoon has failed in India. Southern Indian rivers are fed by monsoons, whether it's Krishna, Kaveri, Tungabhadra, all these rivers are fed by monsoon rains. If there are no rains, Southern India would have been a dust bowl. There'd be absolutely no life possible. Northern Indian rivers are fed by glaciers. If there's no monsoon, those glacier packs also go down and even those rivers are run dry. So we had to question what kind of migrations would have been there from India when we had a 200 year drought in 2000 BCE. And there's some evidence for that. For example, this paper in 2017 in Nature, 
This is talking about oxygen-18 isotope. It's a scientific study, right? So they're trying to see natural oxygen to isotope oxygen. How do isotopes form? When there's lightning in the air, right? When there's lightning in the air, sometimes an atom might get one more neutron. That becomes an isotope. So they can calibrate it in the lab and say this is the kind of calibration and they can talk to you about dry spells and wet spells. They got data from all of these places to make the studies. And they came about saying that these orange spots, these are the dry spells in Indian history. This timeline is 2000 is present. This is 3000 BC, 4000 BC. Exactly in 2000 BC, for 200 years or more, India underwent a very dry spell, according to the scientific study that I just presented to you. Exactly what was there in the earlier Nature paper also that said the same thing. So we have got collaboration evidence. We got evidence in this publication that says that certain skeletons they found in Mesopotamia doing empty DNA analysis, they found that they are related to northern India. What are northern Indian DNA doing in Sumeria and Mesopotamia? This happened in 2000 BC, which means Indians have migrated out up to Syria. That is what this is talking about. This is an interesting thing that came in science. It is talking about the Iceman. Iceman was a specimen they found in Swiss Alps. They thought it was a recent murder, but it turned out to be a well-preserved body, 5,300 years old. Many, many studies were done, including what was the last stomach content, what did he eat last? they found the H. pylori bacteria that has got a relationship to northern Indian bacteria. So how is that possible unless he had a last meal, was a curry meal or he had some social relations with Indians or whatever, but very interesting to see that. This is the strongest evidence that we have. 2019 in science, this paper came out where this is a famous Indian humped bull, right? This, you see this in every village. This animal is unique to India. It is adapted to India's arid conditions. It can survive, even the drought, it can survive. These researchers found that suddenly, 4,200 years ago, this boss syndicus is called Zebu. The prevalence of this animal went up in the Mesopotamian lands. With the fertile, fertile crescent means a Ni uh, Nile River Valley, Tigris River Valley, Euphrates River Valley. So that is where the prevalence of these bulls went up. The bones have been found suddenly, he says. And he says it came from this multi-century drought in Indus Valley. Now the cattle will not go by themselves. The cattle will go along with their owners. In the past and even today, the wealth of a person is the amount of cattle that he has. If there's no water in Mohenjo-daro, there's no water in India, you would have gone out to where water is. There's no passport visa those days. You go and settle where water is. That is what we see here. And this is an Akkadian seal in a Paris museum that is showing the Indian long bull. For a long time, I wondered, why are they showing the Indian long bull in Akkadian civilization? After this paper came out, it was clear to me. It is very, very important for them. If they had drought, this animal would help them to survive the drought. I will skip this. Then there is this question about rice. Where was rice cultivated, right? So they said that agriculture was invented in Turkey, 7000 BCE, and spread to India. But Professor Thakur Singh and others from Lucknow, in Current Science 2018, they published that paddy was grown in Lahura Deva Lake in Ganga Plain for the diet and study, going back almost 9,000 years. So India clearly was already growing paddy. We already had agriculture, already a settled civilization by this kind of time frame in the Ganga Plains. That is what this is telling us. And this is an interesting paper that came out in 2007. This researcher wanted to say, where is the genetic ancestor of the common house mice? So he said that by studying that, India is the home of the common house mice. From India, this mice has gone to Madagascar, to Af uh, Africa, to Europe, to Central Asia, to Southeast Asia, and elsewhere. Even today, you know, if you store food, a paddy, if you store in a grain, mice are going to come there, right? Mice will always be where food or human activity is. And as you migrate out, the technology of agriculture goes with you, the mice are going to follow you wherever you're going. So even indirectly through animal genomics, we get to know similar kind of stories uh, over here. This is a paper that came out in 2022 in Nature that is talking about millets. Millets are like ragi, right? They wanted to see how did this millet come to Mesopotamian lands. They are saying the oldest are these yellow dots, 3000 BCE, and the newest are the red dots, 1000 BC. All these red dots are here. It is from India that agriculture has gone through Persian Gulf and landed up over here and comes here. That is their conclusion. So even in archaeobotany, we are seeing an out of India from an early time frame going to this area. 
I think I will skip these uh, uh, slides. Oh, but I'll just talk about this. This is a paper that came out two months ago by a person called Hegarty in 2023. He made a study using something called Bayesian phylogenetics. A lot of uh, technical words over here. But he did a mathematical study to find out what is the antiquity of the languages. He found that Indic and Iranian, this is the path for Indic and Iranian, they have a common root going back almost 7,000 years before present, according to his study. He said, his studies indicate that it's completely against a linguistic analysis. Linguistic analysis says, from Central Asia, the first wave was Balto-Slavic. Balto-Slavic in 3000 BC. The last wave, 1500 BC, was Iranian-India. That is the Aryan invasion. He's saying, the, his result is showing 7,000 years before Indic and Iranian have already parted ways. And Balto-Slavic comes much, much later. So he says, whether ancestral DNA or linguistics, it does not match his studies. This is one of the latest papers that has come on this field. Uh, so I'd like to talk to you briefly on the antiquity of the Indian people. How old are the Indian people? So far, what I told you is, Indians are not a new people. They are not come newly from Central Asia or other such places, chasing the Harappans to the south. It is not that way. In my talks, at Sangam Talks, I've got several things that talk about paleontology, archaeology, where I've shown human presence going back to one million years before present in southern India, Homo erectus. I've shown Narmada man, who lived about 350,000 years ago in Narmada Valley. His cranial capacity was about 1,400 cubic centimeters, which is like the modern human being. Whereas the Homo erectus had a cranial capacity of 1,000 cc, average in Af Africa, southeast China, and other places. But in India, this specimen had a higher cranial capacity. So people are asking, what is this specimen? Is it already a Homo sapien or what is it? Then in Atiran Pakam, in Tamil Nadu, we got evidence of stone tools made by a superior intelligence about 350,000 years ago. Then ob obviously all over India, cave art is there and uh, several underwater artifacts and so on. Bottom line, in every time frame, we can show India is a settled country in the archaeological record, paleontological record, we can show that it is a settled country. Then there are people who have studied the antiquity of Indians by looking at the DNA records. Early DNA looked at the gender chromosomes, the X and Y. So for the woman, they look at the maternal mitochondrial DNA, empty DNA. And for the male, they look at the Y chromosome. The, the methodology is, if you had an ancient ancestor and he had a mutation in his genes, that mutation will be inherited by his descendants. Let's call that mutation A happened 100,000 years ago. But maybe later on, somebody in that descendant chain got a new mutation B. So his descendants will have A and B. Whereas somebody else might have C, D and so on. So bottom line, if we can construct what are called phylogenetic trees by looking at the mutation and trying to figure out how old these are. So the studies say L0 to L6 mutations happened in uh, Africa out of Africa, the M and N lineages are in India. All the non-African population of the world is derived from M and N. So in other words, it says that the entire world outside of Africa was populated by people living in India with this M and N uh, mutations. And this map shows you that these are the ages from 200,000 years ago, 90,000 years ago. L0 to L6 is in Africa. Then you see this lineage coming into India, M, N and R and then going into uh, Europe, then into Central Asia, North and South America, Australia, and so on. This is what has been reconstructed by several uh, scientists today. And the same thing is in Y chromosomes too. I mean, women can't do it alone. It's got to be a male too, right? So you see the same thing. A0 to C, these are all in Africa. F, G, H, I, J, K, L, and R are the male lineages in India. And all the remaining male populations of the world, non-African, are from this uh, male population. And this map shows you similarly, early ones here, out of Africa into India. It's a lot more messier than the empty DNA, but we can track the similar kind of uh, movements over here too. Stephen Oppenheimer tried to show in 2003 what I'm saying. I like it because it is illustrated. It gives a nice mental picture. So he says that the modern Homo sapien before 150,000 years ago lived in Africa then approximately 85 to 75,000 years ago, a group of people left Africa 
and hug this triangular part of India all the way to Sumatra and other such places. This is a generation by generation migration. It is not some group of people walking, walking, walking till they reach Australia. It is not that. Generation by generation migration. And they did not go this side because there was one more species of humans called Neanderthals. Neanderthals lived in Europe. They did not want to confront them. So they were living like this. Then we know 74,000 years ago, there was a super volcano. Not an ordinary volcano, but a super volcano in Sumatra that deposited five meters of ash in India and Pakistan. Even today in Jawalapuram in uh, Andhra Pradesh, Karnol district, the researcher there, Ravi Korisetter, he's an archaeologist, they have found ash layer. They found human settlements below the ash layer, then the ash layer, above the ash layer, they again found human settlements, meaning that India was repopulated. This event caused the near extinction of the human race, right? It is estimated that only about 10,000 adults survived this event. You and I are present here because your ancestor was among this 10,000 people. I wanted to think about that. If this theory is right, then we are here because of this population happened with these 10,000 people, adults over here. So this put so much of particulate matter in the atmosphere that we had 1,000 years of ice age that happened over here. That, that's what this one is saying. Then once again, India was repopulated. Then 65,000 years ago, ice ages ended in Europe and ice ages ended the Neanderthal also died out. We don't know why they died out, but they died out. When that happened, Indians from this part of India drifted to the Bosphorus and settled down there, becoming the future proto-Europeans, if you will. And by 45,000 years ago, from Eastern India, Western India, from Sumeria, groups of people have joined, gone to Central Asia, crossed the Bering Strait 25,000 years ago, and become the North and South Indians, ah, sorry, Americans. So this gives you a picture of how such a peopling of India is taking of the world is taking place. This paper came about two months back. Like I said, if these people came from India, triangular part of India, going up to Laos and uh, Sumatra 75,000 years ago, this paper said you had to push that date to 86,000 years ago in Laos. That means in India also, that migration probably has to be pushed back much, much earlier. That is what they're saying. I don't expect you to read all these things, okay? So don't get worried. So people wanted to see who are the Indians genetically early on. So they said, supposing here I take your mutations, how many mutations you have, next person how many he has. So this entire room I see, for example, I may have some mutations common with you, but you may have something special and so on. So if I take the sum total of all the mutations we have, if I want to find out what is the genetic distance from me to some other person, I can make a mathematical formula that says, I have this marker, do you have that marker? If you don't, there is some distance. And then similarly, I have this marker, you too have it, it does not be. So they do something called fixation index, FST. That's a mathematical measure that talks about the genetic distance between different people. Their hope was we can cluster the Indians into North Indians, into South Indians, into Brahmin gene, uh, Kshatriya gene, Shudra gene, Dravidian, Aryan, and so on. To their surprise, any number of studies have found you cannot do this clustering. You cannot cluster it into Northern Indian, Southern Indian, Aryan, Dravidian, Brahmin, Kshatriya. Such a thing is not possible. Uttarakhand, people did the studies reported here. They say these numbers are so mixed, you cannot cluster it. There's no Chaturvarna visible in these paternal records, according to them over there. This is from Andhra Pradesh, various tribal communities, so-called Dravidian, so-called Aryan uh, identities with languages. They said, there's no way we can find out any clustering possible. They are all mixed and the numbers are... Same thing in Karnataka in, uh, and Kerala. This is a national study by a foreign group and they too came out to the same conclusion. So bottom line, if anybody comes and tells you that we are Aryans, Dravidians at the genetic level, say it's utter nonsense because our FST shows we are such mixed population, you cannot say any such thing. There is no such clustering. That is why I say the identities of Aryans and Dravidians are spurious. At the genetic level, there is no such thing as race. Race is a social construct. It is not a scientific construct. Scientifically, if you can say these markers constitute a race, if you define it that way, I'm willing to listen. But then there's no such definition of race at all. There is no Aryans, no Dravidians at this, at this level. Then there are some people who said that there is a mutation called R1A in the male lineage that seems to be there in Scandinavian countries, that is also there in Uttar Pradesh, that is also there somewhere in Tokarian civilization, so in China. 
and they said this is the language gene. This is the one that came from Central Asia over here. That's why you have commonality in, in Scandinavia and here. So several people tried, they called it language gene. Several people studied it, Bashu, Kevisil, Cordius, Sengupta. I summarized their studies to show for Arvane what was his opinion. Some people, Bashu said Central Asia, Kevisil said Southern Asia, North India, Southern Asia, South Asia, Northwest India, South Asia, South Asia. So several researchers indicate that South Asia is where Arvane also came. At the same time, there are some researchers who maintain Central Asia was a place. All this depends on the data that you use for studies. That's why you have these differences. Then in 2018, Reich, who's from Harvard Medical School, he said, why do we restrict ourselves to gender chromosomes? Why don't we look at the 22 autosomes that we have? So if we look at all the chromosomes, maybe we'll get a better picture. That's called genome-wide studies. It is very expensive to do it in the earlier times, but now it's cheaper to do this kind of thing. So in 2018, he came out with a paper saying 7000 BCE from Iran, these farmers settled in India, becoming ancestral South Indians, ancestral North Indians. To this mix, he added this Aryan invasion to 2000 BCE and said Indians are related to these ancestral South Indians, North Indians who came from Iran. That was his take. At that time, I gave several talks, including on Sangam talks. If you see my 2018 Sangam talks, I criticized this work thoroughly. I said in India, we have got Vedas and Puranas talking about Anu and Drihyu. After the Dasaragnya, we are told that Anu and Drihyu migrated out of India. There are people today linguistically trying to identify them as the Elan people of uh, Russia with the Greek Helen people in, uh, in Greece and others. So I asked, we have data from Bhagavad Purana, Vishnu Purana, Vayu Purana, Brahmanda Purana, Matsya Purana, Rig Veda. Am I going to discard the evidence from my internal text? because a study has come from Harvard Medical School that does not show any evidence of out of India. I said, red flag, I don't trust this result. And I said at that time, you should do sensitivity analysis. If you take some pieces of data out of your mathematical work and put some other data in, will you still converge to the same answer? If you converge to the same answer, you've got a robust theory, I'll buy it. If you converge to a different answer, then your study is very sensitive to the original data points. That was my criticism when I talked about these. I also said we had the drying up of Saraswati in 1900 BCE. We had 200 year monsoon failure, evidence of Indians moving out in 2000 BC. That is not seen over here. So why would people come to India when there's no water in 2000 BCE? So clearly something is wrong. That, that was the criticism that I levied. And 2019, as if he heard what I said, he added 11 more samples in his mathematical study. And the minute he did that, his mathematical results converged to a different answer. In a different answer, he retracted his earlier claim that Iranians had come to India. That claim is gone now. But he's still holding on to the claim that Aryan invasion has happened. So I contest that. So what, that is where it is. And I've shown my confidence methodology with genetics. If somebody says that I have marker A and you have marker B, that is a fact. It's a fact because I can go to a lab, do some saliva testing, and I can show that it's there. 100%, no problem. We can accept that. But then if somebody says 20% of the people in this room have this RNA gene that came from Central Asia or some such place, I have a problem with that. You cannot conclude that based on the kind of studies we're doing statistically or otherwise you can't do that. Then finally, if somebody says that we have uh, some percentage from Central Asia or something in our genes, utterly bogus. I don't buy that at all because I know the math that is used here. There's no way that kind of mathematics can give this kind of answer. So I say there are problems with models, methodology, data, samples and claims. Results cannot be global. You cannot do a study and say, I now know what is caste system. Caste system started in 2000 years ago. All that is nonsense. You can say in the context of a narrow study that I've done, with the narrow data points that I've done, I'll make a small claim. I will not put it to the entire 1.3 billion Indian people. That is bombastic and that is utterly wrong. That is what I'm saying there. And I have been saying this from 2018. If you see my paper uh, in Sangam Talks, you'll find that I was criticizing all these things. This paper came out in, um, I think in 2022, where this man said exactly what I have been saying, but it came out in a paper form. This is a paper I should have written, but I did not write. So he's saying principal component analysis is highly biased and must be reevaluated. He says, these can be easily manipulated to generate desired outcomes. I showed how in PCA analysis and genetics, if you form a matrix, 
you can easily select your sample data size types so that some entries in the matrix are larger than some other matrices. Then if you do principal component analysis, you'll get the desired result. I said this is utterly bogus. I've been working in this for 30 years. I know all the kind of nonsense that can happen here. This man is saying exactly the same. And he says we have to reevaluate more than 32,000 to 216,000 genetics papers that have been made with this technology. This is a paper that talked about how farming spread from West Asia to Europe between 9,600 years to 4,000 BCE. In this, they have tried to show that farming came in Anatolia and spread to Europe. I have no problem with this. Where I do have a problem is over here. They have tried to show it came into India from uh, Central Asia into here. And that is where I have a problem because all our results in archaeobotany, cattle genomics and various other places are not showing you many such data. All of that is indicating that agriculture has gone out of India into Mesopotamia and impacted these civilizations and gone on to the rest of the world. So other than this portion, I am okay with all of these things, but not here. And I'd like to show you the cell paper that also calls into question this particular one. Eventually, they're able to recover some DNA from that skeleton and they sent it out to South Korea for analysis. To be neutral, right? Indians should not do it. They'll say partisan studies. And it's reported by Vasan Shinde, Neeraj Jarai and others in cell paper. And their final result was, there is something called Indus Valley Climb that has got a common ancestor with Andamanese hunter-gatherers going back to remote antiquity. This is the early migration I talked about, 75,000 years ago, people coming into India, going on outside of India. It's related to that. Then he's talking about Iranian hunter-gatherers. Now, the way anthropologists talk is that early on, we are hunter-gatherers, right? Do you buy that? We are hunter-gatherers. Eventually, we learn to domesticate the cow or the sheep and other things. We become herders. Eventually, we learn agriculture and we become farmers. So that is the terminology used here. Iranian hunter-gatherer in 10,000 BC is 100% Indian. Orange color that you can see. Iranian herders, 8,000 BC, are 100% Indians. Iranian farmers, 4,000 BCE, 70% Indian and some Anatolian content also over here. This is the Harappan gene paper that has come, clearly showing an out of India. This is wrong. From the cell paper, we know it is out of India, going here and supporting the rest of the world. So India has been a Vishwaguru, not only in the present times, but in very, very ancient times in agriculture and other things. There is enough scientific evidence to back this. It's not a bombastic statement. And the other area I'd like to touch about is antiquity as seen in Indian astronomy. Many people, the minute I say nakshatra, they'll have a Pavlovian response, right? They'll say, oh, this is Jataka, horoscopes, I don't believe all these things, and uh, uh, this kind of uh, Jyotisha and such things. This is the indoctrination our people have undergone. They have been made to reject their own sciences, their own methodologies and so on, and to react in this Pavlovian manner. So anyway, I hope we are not there, uh, and I'd like to talk to you about Indian astronomy itself. Many people translated Indian astronomy in the past, uh, people like uh, uh, Europeans like Cassini, Lee Gentle, Euler, Bailey. Everybody has shown the white font. They had no problem with the antiquity of India. They said Indian astronomy is showing great antiquity. We cannot even imagine what kind of antiquity is there. But then the ones in the red font, William Jones, he came to India and he saw Sanskrit, Latin and Greek are related. To address that question, Proto-Indo-European came about, Aryan invasion came about. In the Aryans had to be in India in 1500 BC. They composed Rig Veda, Upanishads, Aranyakas, everything in India after 1500 BC. How can they have this ancient astronomy? You see that? How can Indians have astronomy that is going beyond 1500 BC? So that was the controversy. So everybody has shown a red font is now attacking Indian astronomy, saying we don't believe it, it's unreliable, all those kind of things. Anyway, Indians had the model of nakshatras and Rashi. Every day our ancestors observed that the moon appears over the eastern horizon at a different time. Maybe today if it comes at 8 o'clock at night, tomorrow it will be 40 minutes later. Because it is coming later tomorrow, the backdrop of stars will be different. Whatever star the moon is in today, Tomorrow, there'll be a different backdrop of stars. Our Indians notice that it takes 27 days for the moon to come back to the same backdrop of stars. So they divided the entire ecliptic into 27 segments. It is not enough to divide the segments. You must recognize them also. 
So they identified bright stars in each of the segments and they gave the mnemonic, the wife's names of the moon. They said, moon married 27 daughters of King Daksha. They made a story like that so we can remember these things. And then they have stories of the nakshatras. Stories of the nakshatras say which nakshatra will follow, which nakshatra will follow, which nakshatra. That comes if you know the stories in nakshatra. So the Indians understood the night sky perfectly by the nakshatra model. Indians also had the notion of uh, uh, lunar month. If the full moon appears of the Chitra nakshatra, that month is called Chaitra Masa. In some parts of India, northern India, they used the Purniyamanta month, meaning Purnami, full moon was indicated starting point of the thing. In southern India, they used Amanta, Amavasya. When the new moon appears over a nakshatra, that gives a name to the nakshatra. That's why you see the same Chaitra Masa is offset slightly here. To track the movement of the sun, they also had the Rashi model. There were 30 degree segments, 12 of them. They were the various Shankrantis that marked when the uh, sun lent her, each constellation or zodiac that we are familiar with. So Indians marked the passage of time by looking at the sky. Sky was a celestial calendar on the basis of which they marked the passage of time. And we have got it's two of our ancient books, Vedanga Jyotisha, Surya Siddhanta, a listing of all the nakshatras that seems to be the same. And the, when the British came to India, they asked the pundits to point out each nakshatra and they said what is the western name for that particular star. That's how we know this mapping. Kritika is Eta Tauri, Rohini is Aldebaran is uh, Lambda Orionis, Mrugashesha is Lambda Orionis uh, uh, and so on. Up to Revati, my own uh, nakshatra is Zeta Piscium. So this way we have got an understanding today of what these nakshatras are thanks to this kind of a mapping. We can do that because we have lost most of this knowledge by the way. Most of us don't have this. I put this over here to show you that the astronomy model is not a North Indian invention, not a South Indian invention. It is pan India. All over India, we have the same nakshatra model. So these are the names, Sanskritam, Telugu, Kannada, Hindi, uh, uh, Gujarati, Marathi. What you see, the names are exactly the same. In Tamil, some names change. Adra becomes Tiruvadirai, Ashlesha becomes Ailiam, and so on. So slight differences are there in line with great antiquity. If something is so old, we are going to have regional divergences. For example, I give the example of computer. Computer is a new word, right? So Indian languages might refer to as computer. But maybe 200 years from now, maybe in Telugu, there'll be a new word for computer. And maybe Tamil will have a different word for computers. We'll have divergences happening. Just like that, you're seeing this kind of thing. So to talk about Indian astronomy, you must have some idea of something called Milankovitch cycle. So uh, in addition to rotation, in addition to revolution around the sun, Earth has got three more degrees of freedom. One is it goes from circular to elliptical and it takes 100,000 years for the cycle to complete. The second cycle is called axial precision, where the axis of rotation is pointing to. Earth seems to be rotating here from west to east, right? It is going about an axis. The star at that point where it's pointing to is Polaris, it appears to be immobile in the sky. Other stars are going around it. That's what it appears to be. So because of that. That axis of rotation is tracing a big circle in the sky. That's what this is saying and it takes around 26,000 years to complete. For example, you can tell the latitude based on where the axis of rotation is. In uh, Houston where I live, it's around 29 degrees, somewhere over here. In uh, Bangalore, it's around 19 degrees, so it's point, axis of rotation is here. If you go to Sri Lanka, Jaffna, close to the equator, it's nearly zero degrees. It appears that the Earth is lying down and rotating. If you go to North Pole or Alaska, it is like 89 degrees or so over here. It looks like it's rotating like this. So this, where it is pointing to is a good indicator of latitude. So that is what this one is. So the third is change in obliquity. We don't care about this. This is the most important thing for us to try and talk about Indian astronomy because Indians always marked what was a nakshatra at the vernal equinox point. Vernal equinox is our traditional new year. They would say, what was the nakshatra over there? <coughs> For example, there was a time when Kritika was at the vernal equinox position. It no longer is there today. Why? Because of precision. Over 100 years, 1000 years, if Kritika was here at the vernal equinox point, precision has moved on. Kritika continues to be here, but precision has moved on. So I'm pointing to something else. Now when vernal equinox happens, there's some other nakshatra over there. With this information, I can use mathematics and I can tell you when exactly were various measurements made that are present in our Upanishads, Aranyakas, Brahmanas and other works, I can tell you these things. So the first is Vedanga Jyotisha. Vedanga Jyotisha is one of our oldest books in astronomy. 
So many people try to date it. People like Weber, William Jones, Colebrook, Dixit, uh, Balagangadhar Tilak and others. And the key observation is, it talks about winter solstice occurring when sun and moon come together in the Dhanishta nakshatra. So clearly, we have to see when was Dhanishta nakshatra at the winter solstice position. In order to do that, we can use planetarium software. That is what I've done here. Don't get too psyched by looking at this. If you take Earth's latitudes and longitudes and project them on the sky, they become celestial coordinates. So these are all the celestial coordinates. These are the latitudes, these are the longitudes. And this one is a celestial north pole. On Earth, it is the uh, north pole. The sky, it is celestial north pole. This line over here is horizon, the ground line. Everything below this is the day sky, that because sun is over here. This is the night sky, the sky that we see above us. That is, that is what this one is. So winter solstice. To do winter solstice, sun must be at minus 23.3 degrees south, right? So if this is 90 degrees, 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 0. 0 on earth is equator. In the sky, it is celestial equator. This is minus 10, minus 20, minus 24. When the sun is at the celestial, the winter solstice, on that latitude, we have Dhanishta nakshatra here. So this observation was done in 1440 BCE. So Lagada, who wrote Vedanga Jyotisha, who mentions about winter solstice in Dhanishta nakshatra, has to be dated to this time frame. Because this observation is not true today. Today, if you look at what is in winter solstice, you won't find Dhanishta over there. It's something else. Age of Dhruva story. Everybody knows Dhruva story, right? So Dhruva was an unhappy child because his father gets tired of the older wife, marries a new younger woman. And one day Dhruva tries to sit on his father's lap. Younger wife pushes him away saying, you have no place in your father's lap. Child is very, very sad. Cries to his mother, what is my place in the universe? He gives a karma theory to him. He is not satisfied. So he goes up and says, I'll do dhyana and tapasya and find out from Vishnu, where is my place on earth? And Saptarishis teach him how to do that. He goes and does tapasya for years. Bhagavan comes, asks him, what do you want? And he wants nothing. He's in a state of bliss. Bhagavan says, after your time is over, I'll make you into a motionless star in the sky, higher than anybody. Everybody will go pradakshina around you, including Saptarishis. This is what is then Vishnu Purana, Bhagavad Purana, which is talking about this. Vishnu Purana talks about this. But then the Purana doesn't stop there. It says your unhappy mother, Suniti, she will also be a star nearby you. That is a crucial piece of evidence. So we have to see when is there a pole star where there's a nearby star close to it. Today, Polaris does not have that. So the next one shows you, this is in uh, 2022 when I made this. This is our Polaris today. There is no companion over here. But if I crank it back in time to 2800 BCE, Thuban was a pole star and nearby you see Suniti. So we attribute the Puranas, all the Mahapuranas to Veda Vyasa. So there's a chance that when this was written, it was 2018 BCE because no other time frame that are known this kind of thing. So there's a clear evidence to us in the antiquity of some of these stories. So we had to go looking for these kind of data points. They are there all over the place. I have just taken a few things here and there and I'm showing you my methodology, how I'm following these things. Then we have in Shatapatha Brahmana, Rishi Yajna Valkya. He has a manual, a rit ritual manual. How do you perform various rituals? How do you make the altar? What shape do you make the altar? In that, he's also saying, how do you find the east direction? You may all laugh, right? What is the big deal in east direction? Wherever the sun rises, the east direction. But the sun is going Uttrayana Dakshinayana, minus 23 degrees to plus 23 degrees. So where is east? Is it here, 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 and here? That is not true. Only on the day of uh, uh, equinox, the sun is exactly on the celestial equator. That is true east. So Yajna Valkya is saying, Kritika does not move away from the eastern quarter. Therefore, you may light your fires under Kritika Nakshatra. That is the second Brahmana in uh, this, you find the statement. Lokamanya Tilak saw this and said that this is an archaeoastronomical observation. And he said it refers to Kritika being in the equinox position. And we have to try and see when was the heliacal rising along with the sun. And I simulated this and you can see that this is now the celestial equator. From here, 90 degrees, you can count zero. The celestial equator, this here is Kritika. This is the ground line. So the Vedic practitioner would have woken up before the sun rises when it is dark, have a ritual bath, come outside and say, yeah, I see Kritika, that is over there, still dark. And then one hour later, the sun rises above this horizon. 
it washes out Krithika, but no problem. I know there's one data point, another data point. I'll set all my bricks in the altar over here. I'll start my homer over here. That was the idea. So clearly, to simulate this, I had to go to 2982 BCE for Krithika to be heliacal rising to make this happen. Then we have an ancient epoch is encoded in many Indian works. Puranas talk about Kali Yuga, Aryabhata, Suri Siddhanta refer to it, Pulisa Siddhanta, Brahmagupta, even Alberuni is referring to that. Aihole temple epigraphy refers to that. Cassini, he got something called Siam tables from Thailand. And when he analyzed that, he said that it's referring to the longitude of Benares in Thailand. It's referring to the longitude of Benares. And it seems to have encoded an absolute date of 3102 BCE. Later on, Playfair, Bentley, Colebrook, Burgess, they all studied the data in Suri Siddhanta and confirmed this date, that it is 3102 BCE. It turns out to be a conjunction of planet, sun and moon in the Revati nakshatra. I simulated that in planetarium software. And what you see is the sun is over here. This is the Revati nakshatra right over here. Chandra is over here, moon. Guru and Shukran. Guru is Jupiter, Shukran is Venus. They are on top of each other literally. Mangala is Mars. Shani is Saturn, Budhan is uh, uh, Mercury. All of these things are clustered in the Revati nakshatra. Such a clustering has not happened for the last 26,000 years. Or did somebody actually observe this in 3102 BC and we got cultural memory living through the times. That is an amazing thing over here. Then we have got the story of Aditi, right? Everybody knows Aditi along with her co-sister Diti married Kashyapa and they had the Devas and the Daityas. This is a story we all know. Not a big deal. Uh, uh, no, no big deal. But then we have got Aitriya Brahmana associated with the Rig Veda. This is the Martin Hogg translation. Over there, there's a cryptic line. It says the sacrifice, sacrifice is the yajna. Sacrifice went away from Devtas. Devtas were unable to perform any further ceremony. They did not know where the yajna had gone to. They said to Aditi, let us know the sacrifice through thee. And she said, let it be so. But I'll choose a boon from you. They said, choose. She chose this boon, all sacrifices that commence with me and end with me. This is the English translation of that. Very cryptic, right? Can't make out any sense. What is this meaning? Again, Tilak to the rescue. He said, our ancient Indians always looked at the sky, celestial calendar, to figure out when to do a certain yajna, when to practice a certain festival and so on. But because of precision, nakshatras are not where they're supposed to be, at the vernal equinox point, at the winter solstice point. So they did not know what is the correct time to do a particular festival. It is reflecting a state of confusion. So they have reset the calendar to Aditi. Aditi is saying, vernal equinox will begin with me and end with me. That is what she is saying. So we have to figure out when was vernal equinox where Aditi was. That is what we have to do. Aditi is associated with the Punarvashu nakshatra. Punarvashu nakshatra has got two stars. One of them is called Diti, other is Aditi. In the Greek tradition, it's called Castor and Pollux. Castor and Pollux, Aditi and Aditi. If I crank this back in time to 6000 BCE, that is when the sun is over here, Vernal Equinox Point, and the longitude is Punarvashu, Aditi and Diti, and that is 6000 BCE for that. Staggering amount of antiquity that is present in Vedic texts. If I had told you this, maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago, you will laugh me out of here. You will say, you are a fool. What nonsense are you talking about? But today we have got evidence from radiometric analysis. I've shown you Raki Gadi, I've shown you Birana, dates going to 8,000 years before present, 9,000 years before present. I've shown you archaeogenetics, where we got markers that are pretty ancient in India. I've shown you archaeological remains. All these things are telling us it's no longer fantastic. All these things are crisscrossing. It's only our mind programming and indoctrination that will prevent us from accepting these kind of things. But if we break away those shackles, we'll be able to see consistently many of these things. Suri Siddhanta is talking about a great conjunction in Mesha Rashi. This turns out to be 6779 BCE. We all know the story of Ashwins, right? So uh, it, the story says Surya had a happy married life with Sanjana. And one fine day, Surya became super brilliant, so bright that his wife could not take the heat. She abandons her husband and goes off to the cooler region. But she leaves a shadow in her place, Chaya. One fine day, Surya discovers a deception and asks, Hey, you're not my wife. Where's my wife? And she says she's gone to the cooler region. The cooler region is very important. So Surya goes off in search of uh, Sanjana, goes to the cooler region. He finds that she's taken the form of a horse. He also takes the form of a horse. And from their union, the Ashwini Kumaras are born. 
Ashwini Kumaras, the traditional physicians associated with horse and other such things. So the issue here is, we have in the Rig Veda, we have several verses that says, Ushas, who's Ushas? Ushas is the goddess of dawn. So when Surya goes on his chariot, he's heralded by Ushas, the goddess of dawn. The twilight comes and other such things. So it says, Ushas awaken the Ashwinis for their share of the Vedic sacrifice. Ushas is not going to awaken, awaken grown-up men. She's awakening the babies, Ashwinis, right? We awaken babies, Ashwinis, to eat in the morning. So that's what it says. So again, uh, uh, Balagangadhar Tilak pointed this out and said, this is an uh, archaeoastronomical phenomena. If Surya goes to the cooler region, it means he's gone to the winter solstice position. Northern hemisphere, we have got winter over here. So we got to see when was there heliacal rising of Surya, winter solstice with Ashwinis. That is over here, minus 23.3 degrees. The longitude is Ashwinis. So Surya is presenting his uh, twin children proudly to the world. And uh, 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 this is 7200 BCE. I'd like to request you all to search for this on Google. Once upon a time, 9000 years ago, by myself, rajvedam.medium.com. Over here, I've shown a fascinating correlation with science. Just last year, two papers came out in Nature that is talking about a solar flare that happened 9,000 years ago. I've correlated that with the story. Independent collaboration of Surya's story is there in science today by examining the ice core drilling records. If you read this essay of mine, you'll get the references. So, so now we can do a rebuttal to Aryan invasion. Many instances of interest are dated to the astronomy, to the uh, to, to, to a text. Date of Kali Yuga showing a Vedic concept in place in India before the Aryan migration, alleged migration. Dates in Vedas, Brahmanas, Upanishads are showing great antiquity. Our question is, how can Vedic concepts be in place showing such great antiquity if the Aryans came to India in 1500 BCE? How is it possible? That is the question. I just showed you some samples. There are hundreds and hundreds of such instances in our text where you can date it to great antiquity. I just curated a few of them over here. So, uh, if we examine Max Muller's assertions using linguistics, he said Chandas period is from 1200 to 1000 BC when the Rig Veda was composed, Mantra period to 800 BC remaining books, Brahmana period up to 600 BC where Aranikas, Upanishads, Sutra period up to 200 BC when Vedanga Jyotisha and others were composed. This is what he said based on linguistic analysis. But then our evidence of the text, Colebrook himself said Vedanga Jyotisha should be 1400 BCE. Where is that? Where is 200 BCE? We saw Shatapatha Brahmana, Kritika is 2982 BCE. Where is that? Where is 600 BCE? Rig Veda, we saw Aditi and Ashwini stories. These are from Rig Veda, going back to 6000 BC, 7200 BC. Where is that? Where is 1200 BC? So clearly, our question is the following. Should we discard the evidence of our civilization, which is there pervasively all over the place, and go with a linguistic analysis proposed by Eurocentric ideas, haphazardly, saying that Aryans came to India in 1500 BC? This is a question confronting you and me and everybody else who cares about this. So when Max Müller was confronted with this, he, he was asked, should all of Indian chronology be held hostage to Western biblical dating? He was so upset, he wrote his entire book on that, in which he stated that he is going to consider all Indian works as unreliable. That was his response. When he is confronted with inconvenient evidence, he discarded the evidence. He didn't address it. He discarded the evidence as unreliable, so he doesn't have to deal with it. So we call that confirmation bias today. Confirmation bias is things that you believe. He believed in Bible creation date of 4004 BCE. He believed in Aryan invasion of 1500 BCE. He was okay with Vedanga Jyotisha to 1400 BC because Colebrook had said that, but he discarded all the other evidence as unreliable. So this is what we call today as a failed methodology. By extension, our NCRT and other universities that are following this are also following a failed academic method by doing this kind of uh, studies. And uh, this is in other talks I've shown how in every period of time, knowledge goes out of India. Why is this important? Because if we say we are an old civilization, we must show antiquity of Indian knowledge systems. We have to show how did it go from India to other parts of the world. I have collected enormous amounts of data. That's another two hour talk over there that will talk about these things. But in every period of time to the west and to the east, I can show you knowledge transmissions. So in conclusion, 
the Indian deep history that we are taught in Indian schools and universities is utterly wrong. Not just wrong, but it's a criminal distortion. It's criminal to teach our people that this is who we are from 1500 BCE because it has subverted our identity. It has taken our identity and thoroughly distorted it and destroyed it. If that is not indoctrination, if that is not criminal, I don't know what is. So the people who continue to teach this are criminals. It's utterly wrong. Five agencies have enforced their ideology and frameworks controlling historiography of India. The colonial, Eurocentric, missionary, socialist academia and Marxist. I've identified these things. If any of you today are influenced by this talk, if you see anything like Brahmins are evil, if you see a line like that, you should be able to say, this has come from the missionary line. The missionary framework, Abbe Dubois, he's the one who proposed these things. If somebody says Indians are backward, primitive, superstitious, you should know it came from the colonial line, James Mill, Eurocentric ideas, and so on. It came from people like that. If somebody says that there is a caste system and ridden with caste and upper, lower, things like that, you should note socialist Marxist ideology coming in over here. If somebody says oppressor, oppressed, again, it's socialist uh, academy or such things. So if you're able to take any of these negative statements on Bharatiya civilization and pigeonhole it, put it in the pigeonhole and say, this is where you belong, suddenly you're empowered. You're no longer going to take that nonsense thrown at you. You're going to say, I know where you're coming from. You're coming from this ideology. I know what this ideology is. Then you can ask, why should I privilege your ideology? Why is your drishti or darshana so important that that's what I have to listen to? You've not got the amic practitioner and uh, why should I listen to you? So if you can articulate that, the fight back has started, really. That's, that's, what, that's what we need. Then. Uh, they use linguistic methodology to prop up their narratives, but I have shown to you today there is evidence from many other fields that falsify the linguistic analysis. And we have seen antiquity of human presence in archaeology, genetics, in astronomy. There is strong evidence to uphold the antiquity of Indian civilization. Evidence-based narration clearly discredits Aryan invasion migration, which constrains Indian chronology. If you accept 1500 BCE, as a starting date for Aryans, then you must have a split personality because you'll encounter all these data points that are very, very ancient. You won't know what to do with it. So you'll say unreliable, unreliable. For every scientist, you're going to say unreliable. Is that what you're going to do? Or at some point, you have to say, I'll break these chains. These are all shackles on our mind. Break these chains, throw them away. Then once you do that, then you can have great freedom to consistently see all the evidence that we have without any kind of constraint. But if you continue to accept that 1500 BC, you're lost. You're lost again, right over there. So with that, thank you for your interest. It's a real pleasure to talk to you all. Thank you.